Hello, I'm Harley Schlanger. Welcome to our weekly webcast of the Schiller Institute of our international briefing featuring our founder and chairman, Helga Zepp LaRouche. The Schiller Institute last weekend had a, a profoundly successful conference uh, in Bad Soden, Germany, around the theme that was essentially drafted in a memo by Helga Zepp LaRouche calling for the application of the Singapore model that was the uh, site of the summit between President Trump and President Kim to make that a model for all international relations. The conference included speakers from many nations, including Russia, China, from Africa, from Europe, from the United States, and over 300 participants who engaged in a very lively back and forth dialogue for the, the two full days of the weekend. Uh, Helga, by all measures, this was a highly successful conference. Uh, are you satisfied that it, it accomplished the objective you set out for it? Um, yes, I, I think the participants all expressed um, a profound optimism that with the ideas which were presented, a solution can be found. And everybody noted, you know, what distinguishes the Schiller Institute from other organizations. You know, other organizations have conferences on m maybe specific subjects and then have many experts who have their PowerPoint uh, discussions, but you know they, they don't really elevate the audience to the level of thinking required uh, to find solutions. But that was really uh, why I called my presentation also uh, the coincidence of opposites, uh, coincidencia oppositorum, which is an idea of Nicolaus of Kuz. It's a specific, specific way of thinking uh, how to overcome the contradictions uh, of political life, you know, on the daily level, or if you just look at the status quo, you, you never find a solution. So obviously, the main subject of this conference was how the new Silk Road uh, could be uh, applied uh, <clears throat> to especially the African and uh, Southwest Asia refugee crisis. So we had several panels. We had a first strategic panel, which was uh, extremely um, interesting. People expressed that because we had top uh, <clears throat> speakers from uh, government related think tanks from China and Russia um, who represented their viewpoint on you know, the difficulties and chances of the new Silk Road. Then naturally what was also a, quite a highlight of the whole panel was a video, a live video presentation by Roger Stone. And, you know, he, he talked to, on the subject, the <clears throat> President Trump, the Europeans don't know. And many people in the audience were actually uh, both shocked, but also they said, well, I had to agree with every word he was saying. So this was very efficient. Then we had a military, a former military uh, man from Germany, from France, and naturally also <clears throat> Senator uh, Richard Black from Virginia, a uh, state legislator who set the record straight on, on US policy in respect to Syria. So I think this was a, a very important uh, introduction. Um, you know, people really started to understand why we insist that you have to understand the world picture. You have to put yourself in the shoes of each different country. You have to look at the world, how it looks from China, from Russia, from the United States, from European uh, countries, uh, in order to you know, get a more balanced view and, and be able to form your own judgment and not be dependent on the fake news from some uh, arbitrary media. So I think this was very good. And then naturally, uh, we had a huge panel, very successful panel on the development of Africa with African ambassadors and, and other specialists talking about the different uh, projects like TransAqua uh, and the whole development perspective made possible by Chinese investments in Africa. And we had a wonderful uh, concert, uh, which uh, where <clears throat> the conductor, um, <clears throat> in my view, quite successfully attempted to replicate the conducting method of Wilhelm Furtwängler. So this was quite an experience. This was, will all be available soon uh, in the form of videos. 
Then naturally we had a second day, uh, the <clears throat> new Silk Road perspective for Europe and the, specifically the Balkans. Then we had a highly interesting discussion on the importance of uh, <clears throat> higher energy flux densities, nuclear energy. Uh, then we had a very important presentation on the question of how to restore international law uh, since it has been abandoned uh, <clears throat> so many times in the recent period. Anyway, so you may add something, Harley, but I think this was uh, very, very um, timely um, because this was at the same time when the government crisis in Germany uh, quite unsuccessfully tried to find a solution to the refugee crisis. So <clears throat> I think, you know, I want to encourage people actually to go to the uh, Schiller site uh, and watch the presentations and spread them because this is something, you know, which really is important for many more people to, to know about. Yeah, the first panel has already been posted on the New Paradigm Schiller Institute website. And Helga, just the one thing I would add is that a sub-theme of the conference was the point you've made since the beginning of the year, that this should be the year in which we end geopolitics, the practice of pitting nations against each other in a zero-sum law of the jungle way. And I found interesting that both the Russian and East uh, in their own presented their ideas as to how this could work. And it, it's something that uh, our viewers would benefit greatly by seeing, regardless of where people are from, there is this desire to move into the new paradigm. So that, that's what I would add on that. Now, you mentioned the German crisis. I mean, there's a lot to get to because we're in now the post-Singapore diplomatic uh, period. But let, let me start with um, what we just uh, heard in the last day, that Pompeo is going to be going to North Korea. Uh, Pompeo spoke with Lavrov. So there's a density of diplomatic activity that's underway, isn't there? Uh, yes. Uh, the uh, head of the American Department of the Russian Foreign Ministry uh, today said that they expect this summit to be uh, have to have an ambitious agenda, be very rich, uh, that the discussions will, will be very long, uh, that among the subjects uh, being discussed, besides obviously Syria, will be the need to have strategic disarmament, a new INF treaty and a renewal of the START treaty, uh, and an uh, improvement of the bilateral relation between the United States and uh, Trump. So by judging um, the hysteria, uh, this summit, uh, even before it took place, uh, caused on the side of the British media, uh, <clears throat> who are absolutely uh, are talking about apocalypse. And, you know, it, it, I mean, this is very good. <laughs> Whenever the Economist and the Financial Times have such fits, um, then normally the subject they discuss is something good. No, I, but seriously, you know, obviously in this situation, if the United States and Russia can improve their relation, uh, this is obviously of, of absolute importance. And uh, I think, you know, in line of the successful Singapore summit, I think the signs that the Helsinki summit, summit could be a similar, uh, you know, <clears throat> absolute uh, breakthrough for, for the world situation. I think we can actually uh, be happy that this summit is going to take place. Uh, I, I'd like to ask you about the, this question of the European Union, because the, the EU had a summit supposedly to address the, the immigration crisis. Uh, you met, had some very sharp comments on this in your presentation. So I'd like you to, to give our viewers today a sense of what you thought happened at this EU summit and then the way out as we see the Italians and the Austrians uh, responding on some level to your initiative. Yeah, that's the good news that, you know, there are some countries who uh, obviously, at least as a tendency, go in the direction uh, what we have been uh, proposing. Unlike the German government, which really presented a terrible picture. I mean, you had this real knife out fight between Merkel and Seehofer. Um, the, you know, so-called compromise they reached on the transit centers for uh, refugees at the Bavarian-Austrian border is being rejected by many people, including the 
trade union of the police saying this is not workable because this only concerns one border, um, but not, not the others. Uh, <clears throat> naturally, uh, there is no love between these Christian parties. I mean, if you look how they treated each other, um, you know, I think that no matter what compromise has been reached between Merkel and Seehofer, they were so mean to each other and so nasty that I think there is a deep confidence crisis which will not go away. And then naturally, uh, the SPD uh, is now in a very uh, difficult situation because if they agree to this, uh, you know, these uh, transit centers, something they had rejected already in 2015, if they capitulate to this uh, compromise, which is really Merkel's capitulation to Seehofer, uh, then the SPD is, can be expected to drop more in the polls. And, you know, in any case, many people expect that this coalition government will not last until the end of its term. Now, there is this array. Uh, there was, for a short period, the coalition of the willing between uh, the Italians, the Austrians, and, and, and Seehofer uh, on the refugee question. But now this is already falling apart. Uh, Seehofer went to Vienna uh, today, and Strache said, uh, there will be no solution at the expense of Austria. And if uh, Seehofer closes the Austrian-Bavarian border, Austria will close the border to Italy. There will be a gem of refugees. I mean, this is all, you know, I mean, that sh shows you just that if you try to solve the problem within the existing old paradigm, you cannot find a solution. Um, you have complete disunity in, in the EU, uh, you have the Visegrad, Visegrad uh, countries, uh, the Balkan countries, the South Europeans. Uh, then there is a huge uh, a freak out was in the Financial Times uh, two days ago where they said the new uh, strongman from Italy, Matteo Salvini, uh, he is detonating the EU. He no longer accepts the French German uh, uh, dictatorship over Europe. Anyway, so you have a, a complete disarray, and that is why we have been proposing that you have to uh, approach this problem in a completely different way. And even if we discussed it already last week, let me just repeat. What we want is that the European countries, I don't think the EU will do it, but may maybe they, 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 they will, but I don't care, that the Europeans invite Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, and African leaders to a summit and then propose a crash program for the application of the new Silk Road into Africa. I mean, obviously this problem is huge, um, but if you would pick like three, four really big infrastructure projects and you would combine that with the uh, intention to build up the infrastructure of Africa uh, in a crash a program kind of uh, a way uh, that you could send a signal and because of the presence of President Xi Jinping it would have all the credibility that the intention is to industrialize Africa together with the Chinese and that that would be an incentive for the young people and those people who are running away from hunger and epidemic epidemics to be integrated in the uh, build up of the African economies. And that way you would end the refugee crisis by you know, doing essentially what Franklin D. Roosevelt did with the New Deal, where he also integrated the youth in the CCC program, uh, youth who were you know, learning on the job. And in the end, you, know, you had an industrial revolution. So this approach has to be taken. And given the fact that you know, there will be a, an EU summit with Africa, which was announced by Chancellor Kurz from Austria, uh, this year, uh, during the time of the EU presidency of, of uh, Austria. So this is very good. Then there will be in September already a big conference between China and uh, the African Union. And obviously that will set a certain standard. So we will keep pushing this idea uh, even beyond the present EU summit, which you know I did not 
uh, anticipate for one second that this EU summit would already do that, but nevertheless, it would have been the correct policy and it will remain the correct policy and therefore we will keep organizing for it. And I would ask all of you, uh, you know, who, who, who understand that the refugee crisis, not only between Africa uh, and Europe, but also between Latin America and the United States, needs this approach. You need to develop the countries from where the, the refugees are coming as the only human way. And concerning uh, Mexico, there is already some hope that things may go in this direction because the newly elected president, uh, Obrador, uh, said that he had already a very good telephone discussion with President Trump uh, discussing great projects in, in Mexico, creating many jobs, uh, and that way, you know, Mexico could help to reduce the, the refugee crisis for the United States. So this is, this is the way to go, but we need more of it. So help. I can report from the sidelines of our conference that there was great enthusiasm from Europeans, the Russians, the Chinese, and the Africans for this approach. The question they kept coming back to is, how do you do it, given the existing institutions? And I thought one of the interesting points you made in a discussion with, with one of these officials was that these existing institutions are barely surviving. Uh, the chance now is to establish new institutions. Now, on that note, uh, the, the instability of the EU, there was just a fairly interesting visit by the Polish prime minister to the European Union. Uh, what, what happened in this encounter? Oh, that shows you on what a low point uh, this EU uh, relation to its member uh, states is. You know, first of all, uh, the Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki was completely snapped. Juncker didn't go, his deputy commissioner didn't go. They only sent some simple commissioner to, to, to greet him. And then he was attacked by Manfred Weber from the... Um, the Christian bloc in the EU, European Parliament who was very provocative. He said, uh, what happened to the Polish media? There's only propaganda. Why do you only arrest peaceful demonstrators and not the right wing? So the Polish prime minister was uh, quite annoyed by that and said that he doesn't think the EU commission or the EU is uh, an honest uh, mediator uh, <clears throat> with Poland anymore. So that relationship is obviously at a low point, and you know the obviously the situation between Italy and France is at a low point, and you know so I think you know the EU does not look in good shape at all. Well, one interesting development in, in uh, a EU country you mentioned Austria. There's an institute in Vienna, the Institute of International Comparative Economics which just put out a, a very positive report about Europe joining the new Silk Road. Uh, we've seen some motion in this direction in Vienna. Uh, do you think this, uh, in conjunction with uh, the Austrian chairmanship of the European Council, that they can put this on the agenda now of the EU? Well, I'm sure because, you know, remember that in the coalition treaty of the new Austrian government, they have a whole uh, chapter on why uh, Austria uh, wants to become a hub for the new Silk Road. And the Austrian transport minister, Norbert Hofer, uh, just uh, <clears throat> said that he was in April in China and that, you know, basically uh, they made an uh, agreement of understanding that, <clears throat> um, you know, not only uh, the Eastern European countries should be participating in the new Silk Road, but that this is a policy which, which would benefit the entire economic, economic sphere uh, of the European Union and that Austria will be uh, the main pusher and, and, and mover, uh, first mover of this policy. So that's uh, very good. And this proposal you mentioned from the Institute for Comparative Economic Study, Studies, they propose uh, that Europe should <clears throat> issue its own uh, fund, uh, create its own fund of one trillion over the next 10 years, and then have two major corridors, one going from Lisbon, uh, Madrid, Lyon, 
um, I think it goes all the way to, uh, on the one side, Constanta in, in Romania, and also to Nishi no Novgorod and Baku, and then another line going from um, Lyon to, I don't know exactly the routes, but two major economic corridors, uh, <clears throat> essentially an east-west uh, connection. Uh, so I think this uh, you know, proposal is very good. The authors say this will create 7 million new jobs in Europe by building railway, bridges, ports, highways, integrated other infrastructure. So I'm very happy because you know, the more this kind of discussion about investment in the real economy and infrastructure occurs, uh, the more you know, those people who are not completely uh, evil or, or stupid will benefit from this discussion and eventually I'm absolutely sure it will reach every European country because you know the new paradigm cooperation for the benefit of uh, each other, a win-win cooperation is just the spirit of the time, the new Silk Road spirit and therefore I think you know it's very good that Austria has now for half a year the uh, presidency of the EU and I think Chancellor Kurz uh, <clears throat> is uh, quite the energetic uh, man to, to put this on the agenda. And I think this is very good. Now, Helga, there was a very significant development coming out of Kiev. A good friend of yours at the Schiller Institute, uh, Natalia Vitrenko, who's a political leader in Ukraine, uh, her party was illegally kept off the ballot. The Schiller Institute did a mobilization internationally. And one of our friends, uh, a European parliamentarian, Mark Ozani, who spoke at our conference uh, this last weekend, intervened with the uh, foreign minister of the EU. How can the EU sit by when these political parties are being suppressed in Ukraine? And the court ruled yesterday that Natalia's party, that it was illegal to keep her party uh, off the ballot. Um, this is a, a significant development. What, what do you make of this in terms of what, what potential there is to shift the situation uh, in Ukraine? Well, obviously, uh, Natalia Vitrenko is a foremost economist. Uh, she is an extremely educated uh, stateswoman, and she has a program of integrating Ukraine into the new Silk Road. Uh, she spoke at our last conference uh, about this subject. And you know this is indeed creating an alternative because the only way how you could solve the very dicey uh, problem of the Ukraine, which is still you know a potential trigger for a larger war, uh, the only way how you could overcome that uh, a country which is in the West Catholic and pro pro West and in the East Orthodox and pro Russian, you know, and unfortunately there are a lot of. Uh, Nazi elements uh, in the picture, uh, the only way how you can overcome that is by integrating uh, Europe, the EU or European nations, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union with the new uh, Silk Road, the Belt and Road Initiative. And if you go back to this idea of having one integrated Eurasian continent from Lissabon to Vladivostok, then, you know, by benefiting uh, in this economic joint development, I think you could find a peaceful solution to the Ukraine problem. And Natalia Vitrenko, uh, I'm sure, will, will campaign on that issue. And that is a hopeful sign for not only the Ukraine, but, you know, actually all of us. Well, I'd like to conclude by coming back to the conference, the Schiller Institute conference. And again, to remind our, our viewers, Go to the New Paradigm Schiller Institute the website as we're as on, but the first panel is already up. But one of the underlying uh, themes, I guess you would say, of the whole conference was the role that, that you've played, but also the role of your husband, Lyndon LaRouche, over four or five decades, of the recognition of that. And I think many people were probably surprised, pleasantly surprised, to hear Roger Stone who identified himself as a 40-year friend of Donald Trump and who I would argue was the architect of Trump's election campaign victory. Uh, Roger Stone Plin's visionary and idea. Uh, it also came to the discussion that you mentioned about international law that 
a very useful discussion about where does law come from. So you know, maybe you have a couple of thoughts on that you'd like to uh, uh, respond to right now. Um, yeah, I mean, we had a, a very excellent presentation by Professor Köchler, president of the IPO uh, in Vienna, uh, and he discussed, you know, what do you have to do to reform either the uh, UN or to make it function by, you know, addressing the fact that, you know, the <clears throat> very setup of the uh, permanent five uh, obviously is, is something which came out of the historic situation, but must be replaced. But then there was a very important idea that, you know, the future world, uh, which many nations are involved in building, uh, the new order must be based on principles, not only like the uh, Human Rights Declaration of 1948, uh, 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 which is the closest approximation of uh, what, what it should be, uh, but that, you know, there is a discussion in many countries in the world that we have to give ourselves as a human species a, a, an order which is more in correspondence to the lawfulness of the physical universe. And that only uh, the uh, idea of continuous change and development of an anti-entropic universe can give a guideline and that the only people who are capable of thinking in this way are the scientists, the natural scientists, and the uh, artists of, of classical culture, because only they uh, are used to think in terms of universal principles, which are uh, repeatable and therefore valid, and therefore beyond the realm of opinion, but relate, relate to a deeper underlying truth uh, of the lawfulness of our universe, and that must uh, guide and inform our political life. So obviously, this is a very deep philosophical discussion. Uh, it, it requires that many nations of the world, uh, preferably all of them, be involved in this discussion because we want to arrive at something binding, at something, you know, in a certain sense, on a world level, what the discussion of the Federalist was uh, after the American Revolution discussing how can we give ourselves an order which allows self-governance and, you know, the living of, of human be people uh, beings together. And that must be applied today on an international level. And how can we make sure that we do not plunge into dark ages again um, by simply, you know, elevating our populations uh, to think in terms of a new paradigm of the coincidence of opposites of the one humanity first, or what Xi Jinping always calls a community for a shared humanity or shared future of mankind. So I think that that is a discussion I would invite all of you, our viewers and listeners, to engage with us, become a member of the Schiller Institute, help us to spread the knowledge about the need for a new paradigm in thinking, and you know just join efforts with us. Well, Helga, thank you very much. And to all our viewers, you now have your marching orders. So let, let's see if you can follow through on them. So until next week, we'll see you again. Bye-bye.